Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining for this very special Grand Rounds. Um, I'm honored today to welcome you to the inaugural Dr. Alan L. Bisno Memorial Infectious Diseases Lectureship. Uh, we are so grateful to Barbara Bisno and the Bisno family uh, for the opportunity to remember and honor Alan's contributions over the more than 30 years that he spent here at the University of Miami uh, School of Medicine and the Miami VA. <clears throat> Dr. Bisno graduated with a bachelor's degree from Princeton University and then completed his medical degree at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and then internal medicine residency at Vanderbilt University. Um, and Alan's wife, Barbara, pointed out that Alan and Dr. William Schaffner, today's Grand Round speaker, um, were co-interns assigned to the same medical team um, on their very first day as interns at Vanderbilt. So it's an incredible thought that these two future, at that time, ID luminaries, um, began their careers together in this way and remained close friends and colleagues. Um, speaking to the influence that our early relationships forged in medical training can have on our entire careers. Um, following residency, Dr. Bisno served three years in the public health service at the CDC, and he then returned to his native Memphis for a fellowship in infectious disease at the University of Tennessee. He stayed on for 19 years there as faculty, including serving as chief of infectious disease um, at the University of Tennessee. And in 1987, he accepted a position as professor and vice chair of medicine here at the University of Miami and also chief of medical services at the Miami VA Medical Center. He pursued his career in medical education, research and patient care. He continued to publish um, and review articles for peer reviewed medical journals, mentored talented chiefs of the medical services who remained his colleagues as they continued their careers throughout the nation and the world and led the VA medical services in improving patient care. The focus of his research and academic career was one of what we call the big beasts of infectious diseases, streptococcal infections, um, including necrotizing fasciitis and rheumatic fever. Um, Dr. Bisno was author of hundreds of uh, peer reviewed journal articles, uh, chapters on streptococcal diseases in Harrison, Cecil, Mandel. Um, he was inducted as a master of the American College of Physicians. And I'll say I was one of, I am one of the physicians who was fortunate to be trained and mentored by a Dr. Bisno. Um, in fact, it was Dr. Bisno who patiently guided me through the design, execution, writing, uh, revision, 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 um, and publication of my first, first author research article as a medical resident. And I remember well and appreciate his insistence on high standards, as well as his patience and kindness with me through this process. Um, Dr. Bisno was a world-renowned expert in necrotizing fasciitis and was deeply dedicated to the patients suffering from this disease through work with patient societies and associations. And um, I and my ID colleagues who were trained by Dr. Bisno, many of whom are on this um, webinar, would listen with big eyes to his vivid stories um, with unforgettable clinical details meant to ensure that we would never miss a case of necrotizing fasciitis. Um, in 2012, um, his wife shared that Dr. Bisno wrote for his 50th medical school reunion, quote, I have enjoyed the diversity, invigorating medical and university atmosphere, wonderful friends, culture and weather in Miami. I have been blessed with good health, meaningful work and a loving family. You really can't ask for more. Thank you again to Barbara Bisno, the Bisno family for this endowed lectureship series that we begin today and the opportunity to warmly honor and maintain Dr. Bisno's legacy here at the University of Miami. Thank you. And I think now we'll hear the introduction for Dr. Schaffner. Good day, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. William Schaffner, who is a professor of preventive medicine in the Department of Health Policy and a professor of infectious diseases at the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Dr. Schaffner's primary focus has been the prevention of infectious diseases, and he often is invited to comment in local and national media on communicable disease issues, translating research and public health events into language that the public can understand. He regards this as a teaching opportunity. After graduating from Yale in 1957, Dr. Schaffner attended the University of Freiburg in Germany as a Fulbright scholar. 
He graduated from Cornell University Medical College in 1962 and completed residency training and a fellowship in infectious diseases at Vanderbilt. He was commissioned in the U.S. Public Health Service as an epidem epidemic intelligence service officer with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention for two years. He returned to Vanderbilt after that tour of duty and established a long collaboration with the Tennessee Department of Health and the CDC. Dr. Schaffner has over 400 peer-reviewed manuscripts in the most prestigious journals. The use of vaccines has been a theme throughout his career. Looking forward to hearing from you, Dr. Schaffner. Well, Dr. Grant, thank you so very much for that kind introduction. And Dr. Dublecki Lewis, thank you for that uh, memory of uh, my dear friend, uh, Alan Bisno. Uh, I think this is a very special privilege for me and an honor to have been invited to provide the inaugural Alan L. Bisno lecture. As Dr. Dublecki Lewis mentioned, uh, Dr. Bisno, Alan, and I began our internships on the same ward at the same time, Ward C3100 at the Vanderbilt University Hospital. We quickly became comrades in arms, covering for each other on the arduous every other night duty schedule. But we also became good friends, a friendship that continued. Alan had had a great deal of hands-on clinical care experience during his fourth year at the Wash U School of Medicine. And I, who had had much less such clinical experience at Cornell, quickly recognized that his self-assurance at the bedside. And so I watched and learned from him. So it was throughout our careers. Alan, always a step or two ahead, leading the way as a clinician, a teacher, and as an investigator, as has already been described, and as a sage medical administrator. This is all well known to you at the Miller Medical School. He was a dear friend, and I miss him. Warm wishes to Barbara Bisno, his wife, their children, Susan and Neil, and to their families and other members of their extended families and relatives, many of whom are with us today. Now, in Dr. Bisno's name, let's say a few words about adult immunization. And as you see in my title, I've said that there are challenges and opportunities. There's Dr. Bisno, and there's that wonderful extended family. Here are my disclosures. Dr. Jeff Edsel once said, never in the history of human progress has a better and cheaper method of preventing illness been developed than immunization at its best. Aha, uh -huh. even the clever Dr. Edsel reminded us, if we're doing it, we have to do it right. Indeed, we have been doing some things right. Immunizations have been selected as one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century. Here are some quick examples. You'll remember that by 1980, we had completely eradicated from the face of the earth smallpox, one of the great pestilential infectious diseases of mankind. We're still working on polio elimination. The last polio case, wild polio case, was in the United States in 1979. We've pushed polio back. Wild polio exists in just two places, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And we're fighting to uh, assure the elimination of polio in those last two redoubts of this virus. We've been able to eliminate measles and rubella from the entire Western Hemisphere, and the rest of the world is trying to extend those benefits to children in those countries. These are extraordinary achievements through vaccination. Here at home, the U.S. Infant Childhood and Adolescent Immunization Program 
we now have the resources to extend immunization services literally to every child born and raised in the United States. We don't celebrate this among, uh, enough. We have essentially eliminated disparities of income, disparities of race, rural, urban location for essentially all of a whole list of vaccine preventable diseases of childhood. Here's a chart. Let me direct your attention. We see a list of vaccine preventable diseases on the, on the left. The next column provides us the average annual morbidity, the number of cases we used to have here in the United States annually. You can see that there are many, many thousands. For the last year in which we have data readily available, 2020, look at the number of cases we have. How often we have zeros or just very few cases. And in the last column, you can see that the percent reduction is around 99 to 100% for most of these infections. The last big persnickety illness is of course pertussis. And although we have very good pertussis vaccines, we could use some that are better. Which brings us to adult immunization. There's now a determination with more vaccines being available uh, that focus on adults that we can build on the success of infant and childhood and adolescent immunizations. And there is the, record, reckon, <laughs> the recognition uh, that the vast majority of vaccine preventable diseases and deaths that are vaccine preventable now occur among adults. So vaccines, they're not just for kids anymore. Before we get into this, looking at the extraordinary success of pediatric immunization and the challenges and opportunities available to us for adult immunization, it would be good to contrast kind of pediatric and adult immunizations because there are real contrasts that do make it harder for we internists to get vaccines into people. <clears throat> I used to say, and still do to some extent, that the pediatricians are so lucky, they have fabulous vaccines. They uh, can eliminate diseases completely, whereas we have vaccines that uh, provide personal protection, but may not always interrupt transition, transmission. But this is clearly changing. We have a number of vaccines, we'll talk about them. Uh, the shingles vaccine, for example, new hepatitis B vaccines, uh, new pneumococcal vaccines that are much more effective in actually inter uh, interrupting transmission than we've had in the past. The goals for the pediatricians have been really to eliminate disease. We've always thought of this more uh, in more modestly, uh, in adult practice, what we would like to do is reduce the risk of disease in our patients. But I think we can think a little bit more broadly as we move into this century. Uh, they think about universal coverage. We think about more targeted populations, although some new recommendations are moving in the universal direction. And of course, they have active programs to reach out to absolutely vaccinate everybody. We're a bit more passive. We'll try to do our best to vaccinate people who come to our offices. Pediatricians do have one terrific advantage. They have a hurdle versus virtually all children's have to jump over. And that is no shots, no school, no daycare, no school, maybe no high school, maybe no college, depends on the state. Whereas we're in adult medicine averse to those hurdles. You don't have to have uh, a complete immunization series in order to qualify for Medicare, for example. Some of us wish maybe some of that were intact. Uh, this is 
The next item is something that I will come back to on a number of occasions. The recommendations for immunizations are really very clearly communicated to pediatricians and family doctors. Communication is not so clear. It's more uncertain uh, in, in adult medicine. Uh, they have good functional state immunization registries. If you immunize a child, that information gets put into a state registry and wherever that child can go, the provider can access that registry and find out what the child's immunization history is. Many, I dare say most, state registries are not as, as accepting of information on adults. And that's clearly something we need to improve. Pediatricians are professional immunizers. Heck, the entire pediatric visitation schedule is structured around the immunization schedule. In turn, it's not so much. We have a, many other things to do. We have diagnostic and therapeutic issues, drug-drug interactions, the issues of advancing aging. And so, yes, we immunize, but it's not quite as central to our practice, generally speaking. Funding over the years has become really pretty darn secure. Uh, there may be a few children who can evade because of lack of funding immunizations, but there are not too many. Whereas I'm afraid we still have funding gaps in, in adult immunization practice. And that understandably continues to be a barrier for both patients and for providers. So with that background, let's talk a little bit about the adult immunization gap. Here's just some examples. We have some vaccines on the left with age groups. Over on the right, the column gives us the Healthy People 2020, that was a couple of years ago, the goals that were established nationally. And you can see what our current approximate rate of immunization is. For example, for people age 65 and older, the annual proportion of people who receive influenza vaccine is about two thirds of the population, give or, give or take a few percentage points. Uh, it's been that way for the longest time, 10, 15 years, despite the fact that some people in that age cohort each year graduate to heaven uh, and new people, perhaps against their wishes, <laughs> age into that age group, but they don't bring new attitudes with them or we're not capable of reaching out to them beyond that. And it should be noted that for people age 65 and older, virtually all of whom have Medicare, you just have to roll up your sleeve. You don't have to reach for your wallet. The vaccine is free and the provider gets an administration fee. So we do a tremendous job in immunizing two thirds of the population, but we haven't been able to get beyond that. The healthy people goal was 90%. Uh, for people who are older than 19 years of age, who have, who, I mean, the, the, the recommendation has been for a long time that everyone receive vaccine. You can see we do much less well. And comparably for pneumococcal and zoster vaccines also. You can see that there are gaps. And if we look further into these data, we'll see further gaps by race, by ethnic disparities, and by income. So we're not anywhere close to what our friends in pediatrics have been able to achieve. Now, I thought before we went into actually some of the recommendations, I want to say a few words about CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Now this committee has been much in the news because of COVID, but I find that most of my internist colleagues uh, are pretty vague about this committee and how it works. So I thought I would uh, fill you in just a little bit so you can see where the recommendations come from. The ACIP or ACIP, 
as it's often known, was established in 1962 to guide vaccination practices in public health clinics. It was advisory. It's an advisory committee to the director of the CDC and beyond to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And it was designed to eliminate two-tiered approaches to immunization services. The committee members quickly said, we're not going to have one set of recommendations for private practice and another for public clinics. And so they gathered collaborations with professional societies to jointly make recommendations. And as such, we have harmonized recommendations that include input from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and to a degree from the American College of Physicians. <clears throat> we can't go into this in detail, but I wish they were a little bit more engaged, the American College of Physicians. That's our internist organization, an organization to which I am really quite devoted. They participate more actively than they used to, but still not to the same degree as some of those other professional societies that I've mentioned. And that's at the root of why some of these recommendations aren't transmitted as vigorously to internists as they are to pediatricians and family docs. The committee has 15 voting members. They're drawn from vaccinology, state and local public health, pediatrics, family medicine, internal medicine. We've had internists and do on the current committee and infectious diseases. One of the 15 must be a lay person, a lay person representing the public who is interested in vaccines. They have four year terms and they have very strict conflict of interest uh, guidelines and requirements. They also have what are called liaison representatives. They sit at the literal, when they meet in person, the literal outer table. They are accredited members from a series of professional organizations. The liaisons can participate fully in the discussions, but they don't vote. The voting members are the 15. They meet three times a year, except with COVID, where there's been an avalanche of meetings that are specially called. And they have a whole series of subcommittees, working groups, usually that are vaccine specific, that deal with all the aspects of the vaccine and the epidemiology of the disease that you can imagine. As they create their recommendations, they do so through a structured, uh, mechanism to evaluate the quality of the evidence. That's one that is now widely used around the world called GRADE. And then they use an evidence to recommendations framework so that the structure of the thinking and the discussion is evident to all. The recommendations are voted on by the full ACIP to provide both clinical and public health guidance, they have a dual function, protect the individual and also the committee. Because they are advisory to the CDC, they have had a traditional emphasis on societal protection. The public health aspect is more prominent than the individual. That's also one of the reasons that they function better in pediatrics than they do in adult medicine. Importantly, they are a model of transparent functioning. You can watch them at their full meetings, real time on the internet, and every meeting has designated time for public comment. They publish their recommendations in the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Here are some examples. And they also publish uh, immunization schedules for infants, uh, children and adolescents, and for adults. They come in two charts. Here's chart number one for the adult schedule. 
Uh, you can get that at the CDC website and also annually through the Annals of Internal Medicine. You can see the vaccines are listed on the left. Across the top are the age groups. And then there's a color-coded scheme that lets you know whether your patient, who may be 28 years of age, might be eligible for this or that vaccine. A whole lot of footnotes come with it, more information. Uh, this is like anything else. If you start to use it, you'll get, to, uh, you'll get more comfortable with it. And they have a companion chart, which tells you the same thing. The vaccines are on the left, but across the top are a series of medical conditions, behaviors, or occupations that might make people more or less apt to receive one vaccine or another. So you can go into the chart, whether by age or by underlying condition. Do they have linear, end-stage renal disease, heart or lung disease? Are they pregnant? And you can also get information according to those circumstances that will help guide your practice. Pediatricians often have their comparable charts taped up on the walls of their clinics so they can have them ready for easy reference. Now, with that background, a few words about adult immunization specifically. Here are the major core adult vaccines. Travel vaccines aside and leftover vaccines from pediatrics, if you haven't been uh, caught up with them, I've put them aside. These are the major vaccines. We'll talk about some of them, particularly those that have had some new recommendations. This is particularly apt because related to the pandemic and people staying home, there's been throughout the age spectrum, a profound reduction in immunization activities. I know we've started telemedicine and much of that is very, very effective, but we haven't been able to figure out how to vaccinate through the computer. So as patients have come back in person, taking an immunization history and getting them caught up has become even more important. It's been estimated that among adolescents, for example, during the pandemic, we've not vaccinated uh, 10 million, uh, we've not vaccinated adolescents with 10 million doses of vaccine that they should have received. And with adults, it's around 27 million. So we have a lot of catch up to do. We're at the end of flu season. Let's just say a few words about influenza vaccine, which we know annually causes a lot of sickness, office visits, uh, school absence. Depending upon the severity of the season, 4,000 to 40,000 excess hospitalizations, as many uh, uh, deaths, excuse me, and as many as 200,000 hospitalizations. What many people don't realize is that we've been gathering more information over the last 10 or 15 years the inflammatory response that's set up by the body's response to the influenza virus, even as it abates and you recover from the acute illness, sets up an increased risk over a period of time variously defined in various studies as from a week to as long as six weeks of an increased risk of both myocardial infarction and stroke. This is not as well recognized by most of, most of us because the data are relatively new. It's also clear that for people who are on the edge of frailty, if they get a bout of influenza that puts them in the bed, their recovery likely will not get them back to their level of routine activities that they can participate, the activities of daily living. And it may be the first domino that falls that sets them down on a slide to progressive disability. All more reasons to really be focused 
on influenza vaccine. The recommendations are simple. Everyone older than six months should receive it. And you can see there's a list of folks over on the right hand in whom we have a special interest in getting vaccinated because they're all, all more likely to get more severe disease, the complications of pneumonia. It's true. Influenza vaccine is a good but not yet perfect vaccine, and its effectiveness varies substantially from year to year and in different subpopulations. That's exactly true. But please remember, even when there's not a very good match, the data show year to year that those who are vaccinated have attenuated severity of disease. They're less likely to need hospital admission, intensive care unit admission, and they're less likely to die. And as I tell my patients, what's wrong with that? Let's get the vaccine, even though it's not perfect. And so if you need another reason to persuade your patients to be vaccinated, that's it. And we need to remind ourselves, as that French philosopher Voltaire admonished us, waiting for perfection is the enemy of the current good. We have a pretty good vaccine that can do a lot of good if we make sure our patients get it. Now, new information, relatively speaking, from the ACIP. You may not have heard about this. You know about pneumococcal vaccines. And as I say previously, we had two of them available. Polysaccharide vaccine, that's an old one. It's been around since the 1980s and it protects against 23 serotypes, but it's a polysaccharide vaccine. It doesn't boost, right? But then came the conjugate vaccine. First, conjugate vaccine seven, and then conjugate vaccine 13. That's the one until recently that's been exclusively available. That's given to every child. And not only are children uh, protected from invasive pneumococcal disease, bacteremia and meningitis, their rates have gone virtually to zero. But because conjugate vaccine also tends to eliminate pneumococcal carriage, they haven't spread it to adults. And there's been a profound indirect effect in adults by vaccinating the children, the pneumococcal types represented in this, in PCV7 and then PCV13 have also diminished in adults, even though the adults were not directly vaccinated. Now, moving to the present and the future, there are now three vaccines available for adults. Polysaccharide vaccine remains, but there are two new licensed conjugate vaccines. One PCV15 and the other is PCV20. So what are the new pneumococcal vaccine recommendations by the CDC? They've simplified a very complex set of recommendations. We can talk about them further if you like. Essentially, I boil them down to this. If your patient has had no prior pneumococcal vaccination or an unknown vaccination history, and if they are age 65 or younger with an underlying medical condition, they should receive now either PCV20 or, if you choose, PCV15, and then one year later, polysaccharide vaccine. So much simplified, but also very comprehensive. A word about shingles. Virtually all adults born before 1980 had had chickenpox, and we all know that shingles is reactivation uh, chickenpox virus. Uh, it's estimated that about a million cases occur per year in the United States, 
And if you're lucky enough to live to age 80, your risk of having shingles is between a third and a half of the population, depending upon the study that's out there. And the risk increases with age. There were two zoster vaccines, two shingles vaccines. The original one, and I give this to you quickly, just to put it in context, was Zostavax. It was a live attenuated varicella vaccine, it was given in one dose, and it was effective in preventing zoster to 50% and post-herpetic neuralgia, even more important, 66%. But its protection waned rather rapidly. Now available, we have Shingrix, an adjuvanted subunit vaccine, which is given in two doses, eight weeks apart. It is reactogenic. You have to tell your patients you're going to likely get a sore arm and perhaps feel out of sorts for a day or so. It is stunning, effective in both preventing zoster and post-herpetic neuralgia. You can see the numbers, 90 to 88%. And given its adjuvant, it actually has become very effective in people who are old, old, over 70 and over 80. So the waning Im immunity that one sees, the, the waning immune competence of older people has been overcome by this vaccine. Shingrix was actually in 2017 named the preferred vaccine by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. It said, give Shingrix rather than Zostavax. And as a consequence, Zostavax is no longer available in the United States. Shingrix is the vaccine to use. In 2017, it was recommended for all, immu all immunocompetent adults age 50 and older. So as I like to say in these sorts of lectures, if you're going to the clinic this afternoon and you have somebody in your clinic who's older than 50, who hasn't been vaccinated against Zoster, you have work to do. Now, just recently, that was for immunocompetent people. There was a lot of discussion about patients who were immunodeficient or immunosuppressed. Uh, we know that these people have an increased risk of zoster. We know they're not as apt to respond effectively to the vaccine, but there was also a safety issue. Is it possible, for example, that administering zoster vaccine could make someone more apt to reject a transplant? Uh, once those data were resolved and there are, whoops, let me go back for a moment. Uh, once those data were, were resolved, uh, it was clear that the vaccine was safe in people who are immunocompetent and immunosuppressed. So late in 2021, the ACIP has now made a clear recommendation that for everyone age 19 who will be immunodeficient, if you're anticipating chemotherapy or some sort of immunosuppressive therapy, or who are immunosuppressed, they should receive uh, Shingrix. They should receive the currently available Zoster vaccine. Won't hurt, might help, is the, the summary statement by the ACIP. Now a word or two about another old favorite, hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, the past indications for the vaccines we have are, on the pediatric side, every child gets vaccinated against hepatitis B. Now, of course, children and adolescents, that ends in immunization world uh, at the 19th birthday. Beyond that, the recommendations have been elaborate and they've been risk-based. You actually have to assume some risk before you're eligible for the vaccine. 
people with multiple sexually transmitted diseases, if you're a man who has sex with men, if you're an IV drug user, if you have an HIV infection, if you have end-stage renal disease, or if you're a healthcare worker who's likely to be exposed to blood and sharps. Uh, and of course, all sexually active persons who are not in a long-term mutually monogamous relationship. That's a lot of people. It was difficult to implement in many clinical circumstances because it was so very heterogeneous and because candidly, some doctors were uncomfortable asking about these behaviors and activities and many patients were reluctant to acknowledge these patient activities, these behavioral activities to their doctors. Indeed, well over a third of patients who actually have hep uh, hepatitis B don't acknowledge any of these activities. So you can see that communication between the patient and the doctor sometimes because of these socially sensitive issues uh, are, uh, are not as clear and helpful as we would like. With that background, the ACIP has expanded in a gradual fashion the indications for hepatitis B vaccine. Here's one that I'm afraid, at least as I have given other CME presentations around the country, uh, is not really still well known, although the recommendation was made back in 2011. All adults with diabetes in the age group 19 through 59 years of age should be vaccinated against hepatitis B as soon as possible after their diabetes is diagnosed. That's a large number of people. And the current estimates are that about 25% of people with diabetes have been vaccinated against hepatitis B. Why this recommendation? In two very large studies, it was clearly shown that people with diabetes who are age and sex matched with people who don't have diabetes uh, yeah. have twice the indication of, uh, of, of hepatitis, twice the rate of hepatitis than do their non-diabetic uh, counterparts. So this is a, an older recommendation, but perhaps one not familiar to you, but there's more. Uh, let's look at this uh, CDC chart together. It looks at the occurrence of new cases of hepatitis B by age group over the years. Let me direct your attention first to that very light blue line at the bottom. That occurs in children and adolescents, zero to 19 years of age. And you can see that the provision of universal hepatitis B immunization has essentially eliminated hepatitis B in that age group. Now we'll look at the next age group up, people who are 20 to 29. That's the blue line that plummets left to right. So clearly, if you vaccinate children age zero to 19, they'll get older and they'll carry that protection with them so that you can see in this next older age group that the occurrence of new cases of hepatitis B over time has really in a very steady way diminished, a hallmark of a very successful immunization program. Now we come to the but. Let's look at the green and the pink lines. Those are middle-aged and older adults. You can see that there's been some diminution and then the rates are flat. And indeed, recently, there's been an uptick in certain parts of the country of hepatitis B in these age groups, largely as a consequence of the opioid epidemic that is out there. As a consequence of all of this, the difficulty of 
immunizing and identifying people who are appropriate with all those risk factors who are adults. Uh, the fact that adult patients often don't wish to acknowledge these risk factors. The fact that these, that these rates of hepatitis B in adults have kind of hung up or even increased just recently led the ACIP to further expand the indications for hepatitis B. Get this, you may not, this information may not have gotten to you yet. Hepatitis B vaccine is now recommended for all adults, all of them, age 19 to 59, and also, if you choose, for adults 60 and older with risk factors. I can see people sitting up a little uh, straighter out there, recognizing that, oh my gosh, two thirds of my practice now is eligible for hepatitis B vaccine. That's correct. And let me tell you a little bit about the vaccines that are available because there've been some additions recently. The first, we have the traditional, I'll call them three dose vaccines made by Merck and GSK. The Merck vaccine for adults is currently not available. Their manufacturing capacity will come back online and we hope this year they'll be able to supply not only kids, but adults. GSK with the Endurix product has picked up the slack and their classic vaccine continues to be available. And just recently, VBI has entered this uh, market here in the United States. They're an Israeli company that have made vaccines for other parts of the world. And they have a classic three antigen vaccine uh, that is available. This is a three antigen vaccine as opposed to the two antigen vaccines of Merck and GSK. And they have data indicating that as they give their second dose, they already get a superior antibody response, a quicker response than the Merck and the GSK vaccines. And then added to the three dose vaccines, we now have also a two dose vaccine available. It's called Heplisav B. And it clearly, with an, uh, with an adjuvant, results in a much quicker antibody response and a much higher antibody response. They have really indicated with this vaccine that they can uh, get better antibody responses among many people who are older, obese, smokers, who have diabetes and the like, who don't respond as well to the classical vaccines. Uh, the, the latter, the Heplisat B vaccine does cost more than the other classic three dose vaccines. But we have an array of products here, tools to put to work to uh, address the immunization gap. Getting to the end here, I would make one, of, I would make a comment that when we as internists are surveyed, we respond, 87% of us say that, yes, I talk to all of my patients about vaccines and recommend them. But the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases has done several surveys over the years and they each come back with the same result. They'll make you frown a little bit. Yes, I recommend vaccines, but if you ask the patients, you can see the bars are much lower. They say, I don't remember the doctor talking to me about vaccines and not making a strong re recommendation. I wonder why that is. Sometimes it's because the recommendations are made very hastily at the end of the patient visit. At other times, it's the way we recommend vaccines. If it's influenza vaccination season, we may say to our patients at the end of the visit, Ms. Smith, it's that time of the year. You ought to think about getting your flu vaccine. Is that a recommendation? Instead of saying, ah, Ms. Smith, it's that time of the year. 
you will receive your flu vaccine from the nurse on the way out. And then, of course, if the patient objects, time out and have a discussion with the patient. We can talk a little bit about how to do that. But I think if we are more assertive, we don't say, gee, Ms. Smith, you've got diabetes. You ought to think about getting that treated. We're much more assertive about those sorts of things than we are about vaccines. I think we could raise our immunization rates uh, substantially if we were more forthright about making our genuine recommendations. A word about vaccine research. It's very active on the left. We have the, the holy grails for vaccine investigators. Finally, a universal influenza vaccine and comparably a universal COVID vaccine, a vaccine against HIV, TB, we need improvements. We have now a partially effective, effective vaccine against plasmodium falciparum malaria that is starting to be implemented around the world. But still, these are major targets. On the right-hand side, some vaccines, many of them aimed at adults, including RSV, that are still in the research pipeline at various stages. But in this century, we're likely to get more vaccines aimed at adults all the time. And not only the substance of the vaccines, but modes of delivery of the vaccines are being looked at. For a while there, we were cloning antigens into bananas and tomatoes, thinking that perhaps by <laughs> eating those fruits and vegetables, we could induce an immune response. That research line has kind of receded and we're looking more now toward needle-free vaccines. We, an oral influenza vaccine is in the work, yes, an, in, an influenza vaccine that can be given in a capsule. Stay tuned over the next several years, we'll see how that develops. Nasal spray vaccines, skin patches, and new targets for vaccines. Not only communicable diseases, but as you can see, other conditions that have attracted the vaccine immunology uh, community. Stay tuned. I have said it very simply, disease is bad, vaccines are good. Don't recommend vaccines, give them. As a friend of mine likes to say, vaccines don't prevent disease, vaccination prevents disease. Of course, Dr. Pasteur said it more eloquently, when meditating over a disease, I never think of a remedy for it, but instead a means of preventing it. Thank you for your kind attention. I'm open to your questions, suggestions, and uh, corrections. And once again, it's been a special pleasure and a special privilege to be part of the BISNO lectureship. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schaffner, for that very clear and elegant presentation for Grand Rounds. Um, I first want to begin by giving a special thanks to the BISNO family, Susan and Joe Massel, Neil BISNO, Lisa Frank, and grandson Sam and Nathan, who are in the audience, and of course, Barbara, Allen's wife, for, 50, for 57 years. So thank you all for making Dr. Schaffner's talk and for the years ahead uh, possible for many more lectures in infectious disease. I also would be remiss for not acknowledging a very special member in the audience, Dr. Robert Saxstein, who I'm sure has many stories about Dr. Bisno, uh, because he himself Although he's sort of on the other side of the street now at FIU, we still consider him a UM and his blood, I'm sure, is still green and orange. So um, we're very grateful that he's here as well today. We have time for just a few short questions. Dr. Marcus, you can begin, please. Hi, thanks for that excellent talk. 
I really enjoyed it. Um, I am wondering in the clinic, we often get a lot of pushback about the flu shot. I mean, we do, you know, we do really heavily push vaccines, but we have so many patients. I don't know if it's a Miami thing or if it's uh, of patients who insist that the flu shot gave them the flu. We know that's not true, but uh, do you have any, has this phenomenon been observed elsewhere and how should we, what can we do? <laughs> well, <laughs> Dr. Marcus, uh, join the crowd. Uh, yes, we've heard that many times over. Every physician will have their own style. I'll just tell you what I do. I, I become very personal. Um, I, I touch the patient, uh, you know, maybe take their hand or if it's a fellow, put my hand on their shoulder and say, first of all, I validate what they're saying. I say, you know, I hear that a lot. That's a very common thing. And that validates it for the patient that they've brought this up. And rather than kind of going head to head, I, I will tell them very quickly, I'll give them information. The vaccines today are much less reactogenic than they were, and you can't get flu from the flu vaccine. And then I become personal, but this is just me. You know, I've gotten the vaccine. Everyone in my family's gotten it. When you go out into the waiting room, look around, Every member of our staff has received the vaccine and we want to provide this protection to absolutely every patient in our practice. Arm around the shoulder. I really want you to think seriously about this. We think it's the best for you. I want to make them feel comfortable about it. The psychologists have told us information is essential, but that goes to the brain. Behavior is often changed by changing the patient's attitude. They have to feel comfortable and reassured. And so I try to go to that comfort and reassurance rather than getting into an argument with them. Thank you, Dr. Schaffner. Many of us have to go to clinic to convince our patients now to get vaccinated and boosted, and uh, we will have to leave. But I'm going to leave the, the uh, Zoom open so that friends can continue to chat amongst themselves. And if there are any other questions, please do. I wish everyone a good, safe day, and uh, we'll see you all next week at Grand Rounds. Thank you again for participating, and especially Dr. Schaffner and the Bizno family. Have a nice day. Hi, Dr. Weiss. So if I may, this was an amazing presentation, Dr. Schaffner, and I was smiling the whole time you were speaking because I could just see Dr. Bizno smiling and nodding his head on so many of the points you made today. Um, one question I'd like to ask for all of us to consider is adjuvant safety and the safety record of adjuvants. One of the major hurdles that I found in discussing the COVID-19 vaccine strategies, especially those with modified RNA uh, mm -hmm. approaches, was the safety record of the adjuvants that are being used in that format. Could you comment on that issue in particular and other issues related to adjuvant safety? So uh, we're going to hear adjuvants more and more. Uh, both the uh, Heplosan B and Shingrix, two vaccines that work spectacularly well in older persons, overcoming immune senescence, uh, are so effective because of their adjuvants. So there's a lot of work out there with adjuvants, and of course, adjuvants for the uh, the lay people on the on the on the call are immune sti stimulants. They kind of give the immune system a kick in the pants so that they. Uh, so that the immune system can respond to the vaccine. What I say about the mRNA vaccines is that the mRNA transmits a message to our body, and it then is so fragile, it actually falls apart, which is correct. It disseminates, and we get rid of it, actually, the parts in our urine within a matter of days. And in cells, it doesn't go anywhere near our genetic material. You know, it stays in the cytoplasm. It doesn't go anywhere near the nucleus. Now that's fact. And I try to provide them that information. And then I try to transition to comfort. Think about it, take a deep breath, step back. We've now given these vaccines to millions upon millions of people. And 
there have not been any genetically related issues that have come up. I don't know whether that works all the time because some of these concerns are now rather deeply embedded, but at least that's the way I've tried to deal with that. Sure, that's a great answer. But the question that I get is not so much related to the safety of the modified RNA itself, but the nanoparticle adjuvant, because the concern is, of course, you mentioned that we stimulate the immune system. And so would there be possibilities? These, these particular approaches were not tested in placebo controlled trials. There was not enough time. We didn't have enough nanoparticles to actually make a, a, an empty nanoparticle that didn't have a mod RNA construct. So no one's actually evaluated the nanoparticle possibility as an adjuvant that could stimulate autoimmune diseases or some other adverse event that we haven't recognized yet. That's more the question I get as a practitioner and on that end of the spectrum, just the adjuvant. Yeah, well, other than the extraordinary experience and it grows day by day with more people getting vaccinated and the duration of the vaccine, you know, since the vaccine, it extends day by day and we have not seen any autoimmune uh, adverse events associated with these vaccines. Um, so I'll just leave it there. I guess if my patient were reluctant, I would say, stick with me. I'm going to stick with you. I'll see you again in five or six months when you come in for your next visit and we'll review this again. But I'm convinced that even after another five or six months that's gone by, uh, we won't see any of these autoimmune responses that are theoretically, but only theoretical. Uh, I guess there's one other thing I could say is that yes, mRNA, mRNA vaccines are distinctive, but you know, for every other vaccine we use, there are no long-term effects. Adverse effects show up within two to three months of administering the vaccine. Thank you. So Barb, Barbara. I am. Are you? Yeah, Bill. I've. You, I've you, just. Go you ahead. You have to tell me whether this was sufficient. I'm oh my goodness! For, I'm Bill. waiting for a report card here. Well, <laughs> I said no I. Idea. <laughs> I woke up four times last night in anticipation. Bill, you're you know that you are just marvelous and I can't thank you enough. It was such- I, I was fishing for a compliment. I, was I know, that that was I know. Case. Well, I wrote one, I wrote one, but you haven't seen it yet in the chat. I, hey, I, Bill. I'll go ahead. Bill, this is Denny Stevens. Can you hear me? Yeah, Denny, hi, yeah. Hey, yeah, well, it was a great, great, great talk. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your getting Hello. Uh, I'm with you. I appreciate you getting down the weeds about adjuvants and side effects, et cetera. But, you know, the truth of the matter is that uh, vaccinology uh, has, has been incredible. Oh, well, of course. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the greatest, the greatest things He's going in and out. Yeah, yeah he's going in yeah, and well, out. Well, you know, Boise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Denny. I'm sorry. I had to say something to Boise. <laughs> that was silly. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Denny, are you still there? The Pony Express will get through to them anything. <laughs> Very nice. I don't know. Denny was... From the beginning, Denny was on, and I still see him. I mean, his uh, yeah, his uh, name, but I don't hear him. Hello, Den can I ask you a question? Oh yes, somebody wants to ask Bill a question. Hi, my name is Joseph. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Um, how, as an internist, how sh what should I say to a patient who is immunocompromised? Let's say they're in chemotherapy or they have some other serious and underlying disease, whether or not it's safe for them to get vaccinated. How, how do I approach this, this dilemma? Because they, they ask me that all the time. 
You can. Well, you, you know, there are two sides of the coin. There's the safety side and there's the effectiveness side. And what we can tell them really with great assurance is that vaccines are safe in people who are immunocompromised. That's clear. Vaccines are not going to make you sick or sicker or interfere with your immune suppression if you're taking a medication. It's not going to precipitate uh, a rejection of your transplant or whatever your immune uh, circumstance is. Now, as to the effectiveness side, can't hurt, may help. We can't be assured that the vaccine will help you, but it is something that we can do to the best of our ability and the best of modern science to try to provide you a, an additional layer of protection. And then when it comes to flu vaccine, for example, we wanna make sure everybody around you in your family, everybody with whom you're going to come into contact is vaccinated because we wanna put a cocoon of protection around you. Thank you. Robert, did you did you have something else you wanted to say? Robert? Robert? Me? Robert? Yeah, you have your hand up still. No, I didn't have anything else to say. First of all, I just wanted to thank you, Em, and you, Barbara, and the family for starting off this lecture with such an amazing speaker. This was the most eloquent way of describing vaccine status currently. And I just am so thankful for this opportunity. And thank you all for this, really. Well, we were so lucky that Bill and Alan happened to meet each other <laughs> on the wards of Vanderbilt Hospital because when we were thinking about this, there was only one person that I thought of and that we thought of. And I, I was so delighted that Bill was free to do it and felt comfortable doing it and and would do it and uh i don't know as far as i'm concerned bill could speak every year but i guess <laughs> i guess the way le lectureships go that won't be the way we'll go forward i do know bill and i'll say this for uh, the division of infectious diseases because uh suzanne uh dobletsky uh lewis mentioned this to me that uh, if it had been in person, it would there would, might be an opportunity to talk to the uh, house staff sure. in a more uh, in a smaller setting, and uh, they do something on Thursday, some kind of conference on Thursdays, and you may well hear from her uh, to ask you if you have time to to add that to your schedule sometime. Oh, because, I would love to do that. Sure, Barb. That would yeah, I th I said, well, I'm sure that would. If he is able to, he would do it. I'm sure he talks, he works with the house staff at Vanderbilt all the time. So, uh, and it, it was one of Alan's, uh, really he loved working with the chief residents and the house staff at uh, Miami. It was a great, great, great treat for him. Anyway, uh, go ahead. Um, regarding the COVID vaccine. Sure, go ahead. go ahead. I have a husband and wife, 65 years old. Um, they refuse to get vaccinated. They already had COVID once. What do I, anything I can tell them to get them to get started on this, on the vaccines? Well, of course, we don't know why they're so reluctant to get the vaccine. I, I would tell them the following. Number one, if you've had COVID, you will have some protection against right. subsequent infection. We don't know for how long, and we don't know how sturdy that protection is. What we do know is people who have had COVID who then get vaccinated have much higher levels of antibody than people who just uh, stuck with being having. antibody levels usually in the past have been associated with a longer duration of protection. And also very important, when antibodies increase, when the immune system does that, it 
gives you a greater splay of antibodies, a greater diversity of antibodies. So you probably have better protection against variants. So there are two terrific advantages to getting vaccinated, even though you've recovered from COVID. Thank you, I will, I will tell them that. Thank you, bye-bye. I have to jump off because that ACIP I mentioned, yeah. it's having a meeting today I that I should be attending. So I'm gonna jump off and jump back into my ACIP meeting. If well, thank you, Bill, again, thank you. My heart goes to you. I'm so, and it's so great to see you. I wish it had been face Hugs to, to face. Everybody. Hugs to everybody. Take care, my dear. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.